like to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23, and we'll have our reading for today. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. Oh, it even says the page, 9.30, there you go. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. Anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience. For the earth is the Lord and everything in it. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it, both for the sake of the one who told you and for the sake of conscience. I am referring to the other person's, person's conscience, not yours. For why is my freedom being judged by another's conscience? If I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the Church of God, even as I try to please everyone in every way. For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. Follow my example, as I follow the example of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Sue, and good morning, everyone. Uh, you might want to keep your Bibles open at 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10. Uh, and there's a little outline on the back of the handout as well today. Um, this morning, we're going to be doing a little bit of a kind of choose your own adventure type story to work our way through. Does anyone remember choose your own adventure book? So we'll be asking some questions. If the answer is yes, and you get to proceed to the next question. Uh, if the answer is no, um, then you don't. Uh, we'll explain that in a moment more. Uh, let's pray, shall we, before we go any further. Uh, Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for uh, the wonderful privilege that it is to gather together. In your name, we thank you for uh, the freedom that we enjoy um, at this, uh, in this part of the world at this time um, to do so. Uh, we thank you that we can be uh, together in your name. We ask that you help us to understand um, your word and what it means to live and speak for you today and um, better through it. Amen. Uh, so for the last few weeks, if you've been here, we've been thinking about kind of how, how to make hard decisions, uh, how to make big decisions in the Christian life. Uh, and we've also been thinking about what does that mean for us kind of as a church? What kind of church do we want to be uh, when it comes to us as a church making these big decisions? Uh, so as Christians, uh, particularly in a world which is swimming in idolatry, um, how do we navigate that? How do we navigate being Christians today in 21st century Australia? in a world which is uh, increasingly uh, uh, moving away from any kind of Christian uh, understanding of the world. And there's high stakes in some of these decisions that we've seen in 1 Corinthians. Um, potentially our actions might destroy the faith of another Christian. Uh, we might even be able to play our part in seeing somebody saved and won for Christ. Uh, we might even be in danger of committing idolatry ourselves as day in day out we live in this world surrounded by idols. Uh, and how do we know? How do we make a wise decision uh, living in this world today? Um, so today we've got uh, four uh, questions to ask ourselves. Um, and really today we're going to be kind of summing up uh, what we've seen a little bit over the previous weeks and working through our final passage today. Uh, and I'm hoping to have some time to kind of think through some of the implications. Uh, we've been raising some topics of application. How does this um, kind of work itself out, not in first century Corinth, but in Townsville today, and we've, we've had some examples along the way. People have been asking me questions about some things. And I've been purposely in some ways trying to hold off from painting too clear a picture because um, uh, I think it's helpful for all of us ourselves to be talking about this and working it out. Um, but hopefully today we'll get to some kind of worked examples, um, not necessarily to kind of give hard and fast rules for us as a church, um, but maybe at least just to help us work out how this decision making might look. Okay, 
So we're in a we're we're about to make a big um, uh, decision in this in this area, and the first question we need to ask ourselves as to whether or not we should proceed is number one. There you go, got it on that slide as well. Uh, if you took this course of action, would you be taking part? Would you be participating in idolatry? And um, that was the kind of question that we were considering last week in the in that final pit of chapter ten. Uh, let me read again uh, from those verses. <clears throat> uh, because the sacrifices of pagans, verse 20, are offered to demons, not to God, I do not want you to be participants with demons. Uh, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Um, so you can't both... Uh, he's there talking about the, the Lord's Supper. You can't take part in the Lord's Supper and kind of actively take part in sacrifices to idols. You can't take part in the idolatrous ceremonies of this religion. So if you're faced with that situation, um, you definitely don't do it. And in fact, you flee. Um, you run away as fast as you can. Um, but when that rule is kind of placed there, our instinct might be, gosh, if we're to flee idolatry, we just need to remove ourselves as far as possible, wrap ourselves up in cotton wool so we never go anywhere near anything remotely like that. And there might be a good instinct there, but the danger is that that was also maybe the instinct of the Pharisees in the Bible, people that kind of added on rules, around rules, to make sure they didn't break uh, any rules, but ended up um, just tying themselves in knots. Because actually in the Christian life, as Paul says here, there is a lot of freedom around idolatry. Uh, and there's actually a lot of occasions when you can eat meat freely and need to think about other things as well. Um, so verse 25 on our reading today, you, you can eat meat at home. Um, that's not idolatry, that's just dinner. Uh, and you can even, verse 27, you can even eat with an unbeliever. Um, you can even eat with them when, when your mate invites you over. And do you remember back, back in 8 verse 10, just over the page uh, where we started a while ago, um, the scenario there was um, uh, somebody eating in an idol's temple and uh, Paul was saying that you know that might be wrong but he's he's entertaining the scenario that you're eating meat in the temple in the temple of the idol so even that might be on the table you might even be able to walk into the temple and eat meat as long as you're not participating that's just how much freedom you have I mean you kind of go as, almost as as close as you can but don't go anywhere near idolatry you see that might sound odd um, but the temple back then would have acted a little bit like some church buildings in some towns today, where it's sort of a multi-function community space. Um, so you were kind of always in the temple. You couldn't really avoid the temple. You couldn't really avoid meat sacrificed to idols. Uh, in the same way, I think, as today, we can't really avoid idolatry. We can't avoid the idols of our world. Um, we live with people that worship other gods. We go to work with them. We go to school with them. Uh, we can't avoid it. So we don't uh, run in the opposite direction all the time. We flee specifically from idolatry. So if yes, the answer is yes, and you're going to take part in idolatry, then flee. You've got to stop there. But if the answer is no, then there's, you can move to the next question. The next question is, would my act harm other weak Christians? Uh, this is the kind of principle he raises again in the beginning of our reading today. Verse 23, I have the right to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, quoting, I think, from the, one Corinthian, from the Corinthian church, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. And um, so in a world uh, where you are free to do what you want, uh, rightly so, actually, you still need to think about what is good for others. And particularly, first and foremost, uh, think about other weak Christians. Um, that was the kind of issue back in chapter 8. Um, the danger there in verse 11 uh, was that your weak brother or sister for whom Christ died might be destroyed by your knowledge, by your free eating. Um, so it's a dangerous thing. It's something you want to avoid. Uh, I think we need to be really clear, though, on what is a weak brother or sister, um, because uh, it's quite a big danger here. We want to be careful about how we treat them. So, so who exactly are they? Well, um, I think I've thought a bit more about this since we preached in it a couple of weeks ago. But in verse 7 of chapter 8, if you're there over the page, uh, it talks about people who are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as, as having been sacrificed to a god. So there's some important things there in describing weak 
Christians. Um, they're probably new or relatively recent converts to Christianity out of an actual pagan background. And um, so a few months ago, they were, they were going to the temple to make sacrifices and eat offerings made to um, you know, Mars or whoever it was. And they're still so accustomed to that. They've been doing it for a long time. And so if they were to eat that again, if they were to do that again, um, they would think they're sinning. And so when they see you doing it, they think that you're sinning and they think that actually it's okay for them to sin. So it's actually quite a specific uh, scenario. It's not then just about offending the conscience of any Christian, I think. Um, so you might be uh, a kind of strong Christian in, in the language of this. You might be from a long Christian background and just take issue with the decision someone else's does, um, but you can't necessarily play the weaker brother card. Um, so let's just think, uh, I'll come back to that in a moment, but just three, three questions you can ask to, to work out if you're a weak Christian. Uh, if you see me eating meat, and that would encourage you to do it, if you think that that's actually a sin, and if you think that because of your former background, if you think that because you're accustomed to those idols, um, so let's just take an example like uh, alcohol. Perhaps you were an alcoholic, um, you've become a Christian, so you've sought to give up alcohol. Um, you might see me drinking a beer. I'm, I'm, I'm free to drink beer, by the way, as a Christian. I'm, I'm free to do that. Um, but someone who's a former alcoholic might see you doing it now a Christian, and they think, oh, well, I can drink as a Christian, so I'm just going to crack on, and they, they think it's a sin. And it, was, it would encourage you to do it, and it's because they were formerly an alcoholic. So you might want to not drink beer around them. However, if somebody who was kind of just brought up in a church their whole life and just thinks it's kind of sinful generally for Christians to drink alcohol, says, oh, I'm not sure you should be doing that, um, they're not a weaker brother or sister. And there might be other good reasons for you not to drink around them, just to not be a jerk maybe if they don't like you drinking, um, but that's not what this verse is talking about. So this verse is talking about actually the, the new Christian. In a world where we're desperately trying to uh, reach the unreached, where we want people to be saved, come into the church from all kinds of backgrounds, uh, we want to help people become Christians and help new Christians keep going as Christians. Um, it's not just dealing with maybe judgmental Christians, uh, weak Christians. Uh, the New Testament actually warns elsewhere more about being judged by others when your conscience is, is free. So it's quite a specific area, um, but if you do fall into that specific area, you, you should stop. Um, but if you're free still, then you can go on and ask the third question, uh, which is, has someone raised an issue with you? And I think specifically is, has an unbeliever raised an issue with you about this act? Um, so that's the, the third question. We're going to jump down now to verse 28. So let me read from verse 28. Um, so by verse 27, the scenario here is an unbeliever, I think, invites you to a meal. And you can tuck in in that scenario, but, verse 28, but if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it, uh, both for the sake of the one who told you and for the sake of conscience. I am referring to the other person's conscience, not yours. Um, so this you hear again is quite specific. I, I think that in verse 28, we're, we're still in this kind of world of your over for dinner with your non-Christian mate's house. And they raise the issue themselves. They raise the issue themselves and say, oh, it's good to see that you're an idolater again now. I notice you're tucking in. Great. So, you know, praise be to Zeus. And uh, at that point, um, then your freedom is bumped back up to a, a, a number two question, uh, in a way, thinking about other people. How is this going to deal with other people? And so it's a little bit different to the chapter eight scenario notice. So there, the, the desire was to was to please and help the new Christian. I think here we're dealing with the unbeliever. In chapter 8, we were meant to be concerned about the weak Christian who thinks that your action means that sin is okay, and they're right to do it. In chapter 10, it might be the unbeliever that thinks that your actions are wrong. Even when your conscience knows that it's not, you're doing something you are free to do, to eat meat there. Um, so it doesn't make it a sin but you might choose not to eat for their sake so they don't think that you are maybe, you know, reconverted back to being an idolater. So see, it's even more specific than chapter 8. In chapter 8, um, verse 13, um, Paul said, you know, I'm so concerned about weak Christians in Corinth um, that I might never eat meat again. 
Um, but here, it's much more on a case-by-case -case basis. He's not going to go out of his way um, to deal with the problem. But if it's raised, if someone says this to you, um, then you might want to stop. And I think this, the fact that you have to wait until it's raised is, again, it's a sign of just how free we are. Uh, if in doubt, actually, you can't eat meat, even with your unbelieving friends. But I think also it's a hint of this big principle that we've seen all the way through, uh, summed up maybe in, at the end of 9, um, you know, verse 21, to those not under the law, I became like one not having the law, um, so as to win those not having the law. So if he's going to be all things for people, including Gentiles, he wants to see Gentiles saved. He's going to live like a Gentile, and he's going to go around to the house, and he's going to eat whatever's on the menu. Um, he's going to go out of his way. He's going to spend a lot of time eating kind of weird things at different people's houses. And it's only when it's raised as an issue that he might stop. And so you don't need to go around kind of constantly interrogating the source of your sausages. Are you the kind of guest who goes to someone's house and house sell? Is this, you know, is this organic fennel or is this kind of you know dairy free chips um uh or you know were these were these were this, was this bacon sacrificed to poseidon um you don't need to go around asking that it's okay but if they raise it then you stop but otherwise uh, if you've asked all those first three questions and the answer is no then you are free you are really free as a christian um, to eat the meat to act um so is it, the point being i think there is a lot of freedom in the christian life and in verses 25 to 30, I think that's the big point where I think the, the kind of uh, logic in 25 to 30 is that we're given permission, followed by reason in verse 26, um, permission again in verse 27, and then we have that aside as to the one reason why you might not in verse 28, and then back to the reason why at the end of 29. Let me show you what I mean. So in verse 25, uh, we're given that big permission, that big freedom, eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience. You don't need to go around asking if it was sacrificed to an idol or not. Uh, why is that? Well, it's because of the psalm that we read together earlier. Psalm 24, he quotes from it here. And the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So the default position of every chicken nugget and Brussels sprout in the world is that it's God's. God made it. God owns it. God is the creator of the world. And so God has ownership on everything um, before, you know, Apollo can get their hands onto it. And so if in doubt, you assume that it's God's, and so you can eat it. Um, you're free to eat these things. And in verse 27, again, we have another uh, kind of area of permission given, even when the unbeliever invites you into their home. And so I think the logic is that the bit we've just looked at is a, a bit of an aside explaining one scenario where you might not eat. And the reason, though, is given again in verse, at the end of verse 29. For, for why is my freedom being judged by another's conscience? Um, because actually, you don't need to worry uh, necessarily about their conscience if you're free, uh, unless it's raised. Um, you really are free. Um, verse 30, if I take part in a meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced? Because of something I thank God for. Um, they really are free. And it's an interesting diagnostic tool, by the way, this question of thankfulness. Can I thank God for something? So um, I can go around to, the, to dinner in Corinth and burgers are on the menu and I can thank God for that because God made cows and burgers. Uh, it's a good diagnostic question to ask about some of these things, isn't it? Like, can I genuinely thank God? Can I bow my head before I have this meal and thank God? Um, before I watch this film or kind of click on this website, can I thank God for it? And before I kind of make this purchase online or, or enter into this relationship, can I thank God for it? It's not uh, something that covers everything, but a helpful tool maybe to think about decision making. So I want us to be clear, uh, very clear that we're very free. We're very free in lots and lots of different areas, um, which is a good thing. And we can enjoy that freedom. Um, but sometimes we get a bit uh, scared by the amount of freedom we have, by the amount of choice. Uh, how do we decide then? How do we navigate uh, a world swimming in idols? And um, we really are free. And um, so this is an area which we need to be careful, not necessarily to judge other Christians on how they act. But as we've seen all the way through these chapters, Christian freedom doesn't mean freedom to serve yourself, but you're free to serve others. Saying, oh great, I'm free, I can, just, I can just chow down as many hamburgers as I, as I like. 
Um, well, no, it means actually when you're with your weaker brother, you're free not to. When you're invited around to your Gentile mates, you're free to. And the guiding principle that we've seen all the way through is so that more people might be saved. Um, you want your kind of weak, new, uh, believing friend to keep going as a Christian. And you desperately want your Gentile neighbor who's invited you around to be a Christian too. That's where we see the, the big principle of the whole section is summed up again in our final verses. Let's read them again in verse, from verse 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, it doesn't matter what you do. Whatever you do, you do it all for the glory of God. You don't do it for yourself. And so verse 32 is maybe the more negative um, concern. You don't cause anyone to stumble. That's what I'm saying. You don't cause anyone to sin with the Jews, Greeks, or the church of God. And you won't harm the conscience of unbelievers. You won't hurt new believers. And maybe more positively in verse 33, even as I try to please everyone in every way. It's quite a big task there. Yeah? You're trying to please everyone in every way. And that's not kind of sort of anxiety building for the kind of people pleaser today. Um, it's not just about making people happy, verse 4, uh, but it's about, uh, verse 30, sorry, verse 33, um, but about seeking the good of many so that they may be saved. You please everyone in every way that they might be saved. All things to all people. Uh, so we don't withdraw from a world swimming in idols. Actually, we're actively going to lean into it, into this world to seek its salvation. So do you see the big principle that there's lots of good reasons sometimes for saying no in the Christian life. And there's also bad reasons to say no. It can be an easy religious answer just to say no to all these questions. Um, but actually, Paul doesn't want the Corinthian church to remove itself, retreat into some kind of Christian ghetto. That might be a way of trying to maybe glorify God by only pleasing yourself, but you're not actually pleasing many. You're not there to save others. Um, so there will be lots of freedom in the Christian life, but we will be united by this common purpose, which is care for others, care for their salvation. <clears throat> Remember at the end in verse uh, one, we're encouraged again to imitate Jesus. Uh, if in doubt, uh, what did Jesus do to this end? Well, he lived his whole life for God's glory. He never came close to idolatry. Uh, he always put others first. He denied all of his rights. He even gave up uh, the glory of heaven to be like us, to be with us, uh, desperately to save us. Uh, so then in our final few minutes together, some uh, a framework for thinking about uh, these questions. Um, there are lots of different scenarios. I'm just going to raise a few scenarios to maybe help us think through just by way of illustration uh, what it might look like for us to, um, uh, to work through these questions. Uh, and I'm going to break them into section, into kind of different groups. So the first group is ones that apply quite tightly today, I think, in that they're, they're also kind of religious type um, idolatry scenarios. And so I know some people who are uh, missionaries in a Muslim majority country. Um, they sometimes go down to the park and they see a, a goat being slaughtered and everyone goes around, uh, offered to, to Allah. And I know some people, some Christians would not want to eat uh, a, a, a goat like that. Um, and they get offered the meat by their neighbours, and they generally, well, what do you think, what would you do if you were there? Uh, they have to ask, first of all, question one. But actually, they're not going to take part in idolatry. They're not uh, participating in the, in the offering to Allah. Would it harm other weak Christians? Well, only if you were with kind of Islamic new converts who thought, um, that, it, that it might encourage them to go back to Islam. Um, question three, uh, you'd only stop then if a Muslim family that you were eating with thought that it meant you were becoming a Muslim. But question four actually means that if you're living in an Islamic majority country, if you're desperately trying to reach uh, people from that background, um, then maybe you will. You'll only eat, you'll only serve halal meat. And maybe you might do similar things here if you're trying to reach different people groups. <clears throat> um, we've spoken a little bit about people in Australia who, who come from families that have different religious backgrounds, maybe from a, an Asian background, um, some African uh, uh, 
families have um, various um, family traditions that involve kind of ancestor worship, things like that. Um, maybe you, um, you don't want to give approval, um, you don't want to take part in idolatry, so you don't actually take part in any ceremony with them. Um, you might think again, question number two, if there were other weak Christians around, um, you certainly wouldn't want unbelievers present to think that you were engaging in that. Um, but if your family were not yet Christians and you were the only Christian in that family, then you might do everything you can um, to spend time with them, to show that you're honouring your family, that you're loving them, uh, whilst being clear that you're not engaging in idolatry. <clears throat> um, today we're not very religious in Australia, but some people are what they'd call spiritual. Have you noticed this? an increasing amount of you know, weird things going on with crystals. Some people do things like yoga and they think it's sort of spiritual. Some people um, don't. So you might be in a yoga class and you ask yourself question one and actually, well, you're not participating in idolatry, you're just stretching uh, and that's okay. Um, but question number two, uh, if you knew someone who was really into the kind of spiritual side of those things, um, then you might want to check. You might want to go out of your way to check that, that you're not harming them. I think question number three would be quite unlikely in that scenario. Um, so actually you're free, I think, even though it might seem dubious. Okay, so those are kind of vaguely religious things or spiritual things. But I think as we've said, um, the harder thing for us today is that most of the idols in our world today don't come with a kind of religious veneer. So it's not about going to a temple and making a sacrifice. Our, our idols are kind of hidden. Our idols are things like wealth and pleasure and status and success. Um, so how do you go with those idols? Well, let's just think of a couple of examples. Say you want to make a really expensive purchase. Um, say you're weighing up something really nice. Uh, well, I think that's something you know, you're free to spend money on things that are nice as a Christian. Um, but you probably want to ask yourself that first question. Would you be taking part in idolatry? Well, you know, maybe not. But maybe you are. Because um, actually, I think um, nice things, it, it, uh, kind of wealth and, and prosperity, that is one of the big things that people are living for today, isn't it? A lot of your friends are living for those things. So maybe ask yourself, am I finding my identity? Am I finding my value? Am I finding my joy in buying this thing? Uh, if not, you might want to ask yourself, is this going to harm another weak Christian? Um, a lot of people today who become Christians in Australia, they come from essentially a former materialist background. That's what most of us are. We kind of swim in um, secular materialism, I think. And so kind of living for money and uh, those sorts of things, um, they might be really harmful for a new Christian who's been forced to think about how they deal with those things. As for the third question, um, if there's unbelievers around you uh, knowing about these things, how would you look different to them? How would, how would you make sure um, that they don't kind of think you're just acting like one of them? <clears throat> uh, and I know some people who have said question four, and that actually, you know, I need to buy a, a nice car um, to keep up with my mates so that I can, you know, reach them and have something to talk about. I'm not sure that's ever really justifiable. I don't think Jesus had to kind of go that far to be rich, to reach the, the wealthy. Uh, and so similarly, you might ask these same sorts of questions for um, things like career and for status. Um, are you pursuing a, a career in order to get your identity and value and hope from those things? Um, you're free to, to do almost most careers, but you might want to think about, are you serving it as an idol? You might want to think about how much time uh, you're giving to it as opposed to everything else. Uh, maybe if someone raises an issue with, you know, how would, how would the unbeliever, again, notice that you are acting differently, your colleague, notice you're treating your career differently to how they would as a materialist? Do they see the way that you're maybe uh, leaving the office early, that you're not kind of pursuing promotion at all costs? Or well, question four, actually, if you're, you're spending so much time, you're spending 80% of your waking week uh, in the workplace, one of my big questions in thinking about my career is what gospel opportunities do I have here? If I kind of pursue this promotion, if I take this job earning more money, um, that might be a good thing. You're, you're probably free to do it. Um, but what's going to be best for the gospel? Uh, <clears throat> uh, we spend a lot of our time... Um, pursuing leisure, sporting activities, and so on. Uh, again, there's lots of ways we can enjoy those things and they're not idolatry, 
And but for a lot of people today, living for pleasure, living for self, living for sporting achievements, maybe they are. They're idols. And if all of your time and money is going to the pursuit of leisure and sports, um, then there's a danger it would be for you. Um, but if it's not, you still need to ask those similar kind of questions about uh, other weak Christians, uh, other non-Christians. And so you're free to do these things, but remember, you're free to do these things primarily to think, how can you serve people, uh, other people, by doing them? <clears throat> okay. Uh, well, Paul said, there's more scenarios we can go through. This, um, those are meant to be kind of conversation starters, um, again, and we can think through um, how they might apply in different areas as well. Um, but let us uh, remember... Uh, our goal as a church, our prayer as a church, is very much uh, from these verses. We want to desperately want to reach the unreached. In Townsville, we want to build up those new believers, and we want all of us to play our part. We want all of us to be sent out, and that we can do this together. Let's pray. So whatever you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for his wonderful example of uh, giving up all of his rights, all of his freedoms to serve us, to save us, to win us for his cause. Pray that we would be those who are so transfixed by the gospel, so clearly um, uh, uh, living in light of what he has done for us, that it would shape all of our desires and actions. Amen. Thank you.